The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar today will discuss updates in surgery and surgical techniques for brain tumor patients. My name is Jalan Demas. I'm the Senior Program Manager here at the American Brain Tumor Association. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ryan Barrett. Dr. Barrett is the Program Director for Neurosurgery Residency at Providence Hospital and Medical Centers in Southfield, Michigan. He is also a clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Dr. Barrett subspecializes in surgical neuro-oncology. His training in surgical neuro-oncology has provided proficiency in the latest techniques such as stereotactic radiosurgery. Dr. Barrett is also proficient in treating general neurosurgical conditions involving both the brain and the spine. The mission of his practice is to provide patients with superior neurosurgical care. Dr. Barrett believes in working with the patient's preference and lifestyle, along with involving the family in the decision-making process. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Barrett. You may now begin your presentation. All right. Hello. Thank you for the, uh, the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to present. Uh, I was uh, given the topic of updates in surgery and surgical techniques for uh, brain tumor patients. Um, surgery for the removal of a brain tumor can be an overwhelming experience for both patients and families. Uh, the various terminology of testing tools and the techniques that can be used can be quite confusing. This review that I'm providing is really meant to provide a basic overview of many of these tools and the technologies that are out there or the techniques that are going to be put forth uh, that are available to the surgeon today. I want to define and review some of these tools, technologies, and techniques that are commonly used nowadays. And then I'd like to break it down and discuss it relative to the uh, patient care experience, things you would be exposed to in the preoperative arena, things that will be employed intraoperatively, and touch on uh, postoperative um, terminology. You know, I think it's important to state that, you know, a fool with a tool is still a fool. I mean, nothing will replace experience and a thorough knowledge of the anatomy and, and basic microsurgical skills. Uh, however, there have been tremendous advances that offer uh, surgeons a wide array of tools that can make the surgical procedures safer and uh, more efficient. You know, the, the, the choice of the tool that's used, the technologies or techniques that are employed clearly varies case by case, center by center, and with the, the surgeon's comfort and experience. Uh, Preoperatively or before surgery, you know, what we're really going to encounter is a lot of the imaging modalities, the anatomic studies, which I'll touch on, studies that look at the metabolism or physiology of a tumor, and occasionally we use functional studies. And uh, in certain cases, your, your, your surgical team may be uh, uh, requesting preoperative embolization, and I'll discuss that. You know, when we talk about anatomic studies, uh, classically we think of a CAT scan or MRI scan, and in recent years, uh, diffuser retention imaging or tractography has become more popular. And uh, metabolic studies, you, you may the uh, encountering a PET scan or MR spectroscopy, and the functional studies, uh, typically we think of functional MRI, and I'll briefly discuss these. You know, a CAT scan uh, gives a lot of very good anatomic detail. Uh, here we see a CT scan, an axial slice uh, of the brain. The white here represents the skull. The darker structures in here are the ventricles or fluid chambers. And you can see this hyperdense lesion with this what we call edema or swelling around it, uh, leading to some local mass effect or pressure on the brain. You give us a lot of information. You let me know the size of the tumor, the size, the, whether it's superficial or deep. Give me a sense of proximity to critical structures like the motor strip. You can let me know how many tumors there are, if there's hemorrhage, how much swelling, if there's shift to the brain, if it's solid or cystic. You know, CAT scan has been around since uh, at least the 70s, and uh, it's still commonly used and provides a lot of information. MRI is certainly uh, employed routinely with uh, uh, brain tumor patients. It allows multiple um, uh, planes to be looked at, axial, uh, coronal views, or sagittal views. Um, you can get a, more, a better appreciation for the finer detail of the tumor and the brain itself. Um, and it's between the CAT scan and the MRI, a significant amount of information can be uh, obtained. Here we see an axial view. It's called a T2 sequence. really let, lets us look at the fluid around the brain. Here you see a tumor. In this case, this is the left hemisphere with uh, a lot of surrounding edema. A, a very uh, 
impressive tool that's been developed over the years is called DTI or diffusion tensor imaging, also known as tractography. This takes uh, raw data from the uh, MRI machine and allows us to create two-dimensional and three-dimensional models of the subcortical structures. So you know, the, the MRI CAT scan can give us a good sense of the gray matter of the cortex, the sulci and gyra, the surface. Uh, but we can only, you know, in our mind's eye, get a, a start to predict where we think the actual extensions of the cell, their, their projections are going. But this can actually uh, derive that information and let us know where the actual uh, deep projections are relative to the tumor, particularly when you're dealing with uh, fibers dealing with speech or motor tracts. Uh, it can really change the way you approach the tumor to, to avoid those critical structures. Um, metabolic studies, PET scan, MR spectroscopy. You know, the anatomic studies that look at the raw anatomy let us know location, size, shape. However, a metabolic study can start to, you know, give us an idea of what may be, may be going on inside the lesion itself. You know, is this an active tumor? Are we dealing with something that's actively growing? Or if we're six months after radiation or radiosurgery, is this actually a tumor that's died or you know, been killed off and we're just dealing with dead tissue that may be swelling? Is it actually an infection instead of a tumor? Uh, so it can give you an idea of what um, uh, what you may be dealing with. Uh, you know, we're still not at the point where you can definitively make a diagnosis with uh, radiographic studies, but we are getting closer. The example over here is an axial T2 MRI, and they took out, they blocked out a sequence of the brain, and they can actually do a spectroscopy, and you can compare this normal brain to a lesional brain. And, he, and based off the different uh, molecules that are made up within that lesion, you can get a sense of is it active tumor, dead tumor, or infection. And this would be an example of a, of a PET scan uh, that can give you similar information. This uses CT technology. This uses MRI technology. Functional MRI, functional imaging. Um, you know, when you have a tumor that may be near eloquent cortex, such as the motor strip, or the region of the brain that controls power and strength on the opposite side, or the speech area, the discrete areas of the brain that deal with the uh, ability to produce or interpret language. Um, you know, it, it's critical to know if, if a tumor is uh, in directly involved with that or next to it and displacing it. You know, it can let us know, can we safely remove this tumor, or is this something we should only biopsy? Or if we do decide to remove it, you know, what direction do we approach it? Certainly the anatomic studies, CAT scan and MRI, can give you a sense of where these structures are, but this functional imaging uh, is an additional piece of information that can actually uh, provide us with finer detail and, and actually go on top of the anatomic images and really show us uh, which part of the brain is lighting up and uh, uh, in part of those uh, critical structures. Example here, I mean, the way the human brain is, is wired is there's pretty large areas that are relatively silent, clinically speaking. Um, not to say that they're not important, but there's other structures that we know, you know, clearly if there's any injury or stress or damage to those regions, you'll have clear-cut deficits in speech or motor. And, and that's really where the functional imaging uh, is, is quite helpful. Um, touch on uh, embolization. This is plainly stated introduction of material such as glue or microbeads that can deliberately block blood vessels that supply a tumor. Uh, this can help aid in uh, removal of the tumor. You can decrease the potential blood loss if it's a very vascular tumor, and that can also subsequently decrease the time of surgery. Here we have an example of a case I, uh, the patient I had had a very large uh, extra-axial homogeneously enhancing mass on the, the left side of the brain, displacing the, the brain to the right, splitting the sylvian fissure, and all the, you know, the very medial part is some very critical blood vessels that, if they're injured, could lead to a significant stroke and deficit. This is radiographically uh, consistent with a meningioma. This is a case where we were able to do an angiogram, where they put a catheter in the groin, not unlike if you had a heart catheterization, but the catheter is actually kind of parked in the neck, contrast is injected, and you take x-rays, and it gives you like a road map of the blood vessels of the brain. So this is the external carotid artery. These are normal blood vessels that branch off the external carotid. And this one right here corresponds to this tumor. This is what we call a tumor blush. This is actual blood supply of the tumor. And microbeads, uh, you know, or glue are able to be introduced, and the blood supply to the tumor is actually uh, sacrificed. Can't always be done. Depends on the location of the tumor and whether or not the blood supply is feeding both tumor and critical brain or normal brain. But in this case, this had blood supply directly to the tumor. What we see here is another coronal image. 
tumor before embolization. After embolization, you can see the signal change within the tumor. Most of this tumor is infarcting or dying because the blood supply has been uh, sacrificed. Postoperative film with complete resection of the tumor. This is a case that could have easily taken me 10 hours, but with you know, two-thirds of the tumor infarcted, it became simple to where it was like a two-hour procedure. You just opened the tumor, internally devolved all the soft, liquefied, dead tumor, and then folded the castle or the outer wall down and made it much simpler, much less blood loss, and uh, much less time. So switching to intraoperative or during surgery, what are some of the tools or instruments your surgeon may use, some of the terminology they may be explaining to you in, in your pre-op appointment? Um, the tools we use to aid in, in localization or how we navigate, uh, tools that are available for us to visualize or see the tumor once we're, uh, we've opened the dura, we're, we're inside the tumor working under the microscope. You know, there's various tools that have, been, have evolved or improved to allow us to more safely remove a tumor. And then I think no discussion uh, would be complete without talking about intraoperative imaging. So tools that aid in localization and navigation. Now, the, co the common tool seen throughout the country or throughout the, uh, would be a frameless stereotactic navigation, neuronavigation. Uh, there's various intraoperative neurophysiologic monitoring techniques. And uh, awake craniotomy, performing awake surgery where you get direct feedback of, of the patient's function, which is still commonly employed and, and uh, still a very viable option. Stereotactic surgery or stereotaxis, you know, plainly stated, it's a three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system that's created uh, where the lesion of the tumor itself becomes the, the center of this coordinate system or the target. Well, it's been used for many years for deep brain stimulation for like Parkinson's disease. Uh, we've also used it for years frame-based where you actually fix the frame to the patient's head and the, the tumor becomes the center of the, of the, the sphere you've created and you can use a, a, stere a needle to stereotactically uh, approach the target and biopsy the tumor. Uh, there's also frameless techniques, which I'll show some pictures of, where you have the patient fix the head, you know, secured to the table, you don't have to use a solid frame, but with a computer and um, uh, and an optical array and a camera setup, you can actually create a virtual model of the head of the computer and register it with the patient's head in real time. This allows for smaller craniotomy. It allows you to avoid critical structures uh, and then allows you to be, you know, provide the most direct route to the tumor. We're no longer guessing where the tumor is and we can go right to the target these days and start uh, dealing with the, the lesion once we're there. So this is an example of a Lexel frame, you know, on a, on a model of the head. This would be a, a tool that is fixed to the patient's head and this would be an example where you can drill a bowl, burr hole, and a needle can be placed after you define exactly where the target is to biopsy a tumor, or in a lot of cases where you can place an electrode deep into the brain for a target for the treatment of a movement disorder in cases of Parkinson's or dystonia. This is an example of a patient on a table with a frame on the head and a localizing box getting ready to go on a CT scanner. And this frame is used to help stereotactically or three-dimensionally localize a, a tumor in the brain for the purposes of focused radiation, what we call radio surgery. This represents a picture of a common tool used intraoperatively for frameless stereotactic or three-dimensional navigation. And this would be the computer screen that we see in the OR where we can get a virtual representation of the brain, the preoperative imaging. You can see the lesion right here that's represented. Presumably this is a, a meningioma at the base of the skull. And we can see this lesion relative to the brain. This is the preoperative imaging. With the patient's head secured in the operating room, you can register the head using an optical array that's fixed to the, to the table where the patient's head is fixed. The camera picks that up, and you can merge the two such that you know, your real-time view of the patient's uh, brain and uh, structures around the head matches up with the preoperative imaging to help navigate. This, uh, you know, we talked about the preoperative studies, CAT scan, MRI, diffusion tensor imaging, functional MRI. What's incredibly helpful nowadays is all these preoperative tools can be merged together and put on your planning station. And, you know, you can create a virtual 3D model of the brain. This represents that model. This pink represents the tumor. The functional MRI can let us know where the, the cortical representation of the motor strip is. It's depicted here. The, the, the fibers right here, the tractography can let us know the projection of the deep structures in the white matter of the brain relative to their overlying critical cortical um, motor strip. And 
this is all relative to the tumor. And then I can register this with the patient's head and actually navigate with that camera to put my pointer on the patient's head and it can show up on this virtual model. So I know which trajectory to go to the tumor, which part is safe to remove, which part as I get near the critical structures I need to slow down or avoid further dissection. And it, you know, in critical areas, eloquent areas of the brain, it really provides a safe planning and actual surgical resection of the tumor. And this is all these tools, these pre-op tools are added to this intraoperative navigation system. So another commonly employed tool is intraoperative physiologic or neurophysiologic monitoring. This really provides a, a functional guidance to the surgeon. So this is a, another way to try and pick up where these critical or eloquent structures are, such as the motor strip. Uh, and we can test these functions or we can you know, provide early detection prior to causing permanent injury. Uh, we, EEG is used, EMG, various evoked potentials uh, where you stimulate and you see a response. What we have here is a picture of a craniotomy a patient. Is, uh, this patient is actually awake, uh, head fixed to the table. This is an array that's looking for uh, uh, potential discharges in the brain, brain, and the stimulator is being used to stimulate various areas in the brain. This is around the motor strip uh, where there's a uh, uh, a benign tumor that's near the motor strip. So we're able to map out the motor strip and then plan our trajectory to get to the lesion and avoid the critical structures. Um, we'll move on to uh, tools or um, devices that help visualize the tumor. Uh, microscopes, endoscopes, and uh, exciting uh, uh, technology that may you know, make it safer and, and allow for um, uh, greater resection of tumors or tumor markers. Here we have an example of an intraoperative microscope that we use at our facility. Uh, you know, large base, articulated arm. We've got uh, optics on both sides. You know, the, the, the degree of magnification and illumination is you know, clearly superior to your own eye, a three-dimensional view. In my opinion, it's superior to headlight and loops magnification. Uh, you know, your, your uh, optical array can be a, attached to your scope, so your scope in itself, the focus can become the pointer that's integrated with your navigation platform, allowing you to use real-time navigation while you're using your, your microscope with the illumination and magnification that it provides. Now, endoscopic technology is, is certainly not new. Um, you know, it's been employed for many years, particularly by uh, you know, laparoscopic techniques in general surgery and, and ENT surgeons, and it's been explored in the past by neurosurgery, but the, the, the tools are being more refined, and it's becoming um, and people have uh, studied it and, and found uh, you know, safe ways to approach lesions in the skull base or the CP angle uh, in a minimally invasive fashion. Here we have a representation of the transphenoidal or uh, you know, transnasal cord origin of sphenoid sinus, which can be done in traditional open procedures, but also with an endoscope and you know, refinements and techniques. We can explore the areas of the anterior fossa, the sphenoid sinus, the cella itself, down to the clivus, and uh, you know. Nowadays, certain procedures where we used to have to do large craniotomies, employ skull-based techniques where you drop the orbit and, and um, you know, extensive dissection, which is still effective and still needed at times, but there are times now where that can be avoided. And just going through the nose with an endoscope and employing the uh, skull-based techniques that have been uh, uh, refined, we can safely approach certain lesions here in the skull base. This is an example of a you know, pituitary macroadenoma, a tumor arising from the the cella or the compression of bone where the pituitary gland lives. This one's extending above the cella and you know, threatens the optic apparatus. People can lose vision or become blind if this thing um, puts too much pressure on the nerves to the eye. Here's a post-operative film where the tumor has been resected. And this was all performed through the nose with an endoscope with uh, you know, minimal tissue injury uh, to get to the target. This is a sagittal view, again, MRI. This is a midline septum of the nose, the sinus or sphenoid sinus, and it's fascinating. You can go through the nose, get into a normal sinus cavity, and the roof of the sinus is the floor of the cella turcica where the pituitary gland lives. You know, sometimes we still have to do a craniotomy and come from above or you know, sneak below the brain, which is an effective method. But anytime you can do a more direct route and a less invasive route, if that's effective and you can get the tumor out, that's certainly uh, you know, better for the patient and more appealing. Uh, you know, when these first came out, usually you had to have an assistant or another surgeon hold the scope for you. Uh, now, nowadays, we have a, 
a pneumatic arm that can be affixed to the table. Your endoscope is affixed to this pneumatic arm and it allows me to fix the scope in place and then I can have bimanual or you know, two-handed uh, um, control of the operative field using instruments bimanually and uh, I don't have to work around another assistant in a very confined area. So this is another advancement that allows the surgeons to have more space to work, you know, less congestion, and uh, you know, the hands are not working the scope or the, the tool that allows visualization. Your hands are focused on, you know, safely operating at the target site. You know, uh, another area that I, that I find uh, fascinating is the uh, tumor markers, in particular a 5-LA, amino lemulonic acid. This is a drug uh, that can be absorbed by malignant glioma cells. You can make modifications to the microscope and it allows for a direct visualization of the tumor cells which will rest after you've made that modification to the microscope. This is still investigational in the U.S. Uh, there are a number of centers that are using it. Certainly there, there seems to be um, you know, some promise with this, particularly with glioma cells, glioma tumors. Like all of these tools, and none of them are perfect, and a lot of times they're used in conjunction with other tools, but this is something that uh, I think holds some promise. There'll certainly be more to come in the future. Um, you know, no discussion would be complete without talking about uh, you know, the standard instruments that we use that you know, are commonplace, but uh, you know, a lot of effort and experience has been um, put forth to refine these tools. Uh, the bipolar tool that allows for uh, coagulation of vessels, micro instruments such as micro scissors, and uh, the rotin uh, set that allows for a dissection of the subarachnoid space around critical uh, vessels and nerves. Um, these, these are all commonly used, but I think you know, a lot of times we take for granted that, you know, the refinement in these tools and the ability that they give the surgeon to safely work in confined areas and, and critical areas. Um, you know, another tool is called an ultrasonic aspirator, uh, which is depicted here. It's a fairly large machine that has foot pedal control, and this selectively fragments and aspirates tumor, uh, and you can set it uh, such that the irrigation and suction is continuously going, and uh, the strength or the energy behind it can be modified, so you can get up to critical structures such as nerves and arteries, and uh, Spare those structures, but still uh, take down tumor. This is really ideal for debulking large tumors, as the picture I showed earlier. It's a very large meningioma. You, you know, you open the tumor up. You know, inside the tumor, it's really just tumor tissue or dead tumor tissue. So this tum this tool allows us to, you know, you know, rapidly and safely debulk this instead of spending, you know, you know, many minutes or hours, you know, peeling away fibrous tissue and tumor. Uh, you can aspirate it with this uh, this instrument and uh, you know, save a lot of time for the patient on the table. Yeah. Everybody always asks about laser and its role in surgery. Um, in recent years, there's been an, an advancement in um, the use of a CO2 laser, which is actually one of the earliest gas lasers that's used in many surgical procedures. It allows for precise cutting and, and coagulation or, or thermal uh, um, um, injury to the blood vessel to stop bleeding. Um, the recent design is there's been a creation of a flexible wire. You know, that's really you know brought this to the forefront again in the neurosurgical world because we're usually working in small fields, small openings in the skull and in the spine at times. Uh, that if you didn't have the flexible wire, it just wasn't really amenable to getting to safely to the target and being used on the tissue we need to use it on. Uh, but now we can actually hold this instrument like a pencil. The flexible wire can be draped over your wrist or your arm, and that enables neurosurgeons to apply this technology. Uh, to certain tissues and tumors in the brain um, that we were not able to use it before. Another uh, advancement in surgery in general is robotic assisted surgery. Um, this is an example of one of the robots that's employed nowadays. You know, this is, has become really popular in uh, fields like gynecology and urology, you know, particularly pelvic-based surgery. And it was really developed to overcome limitations of minimally invasive surgery by those specialists, which really employed laparoscopes which had 2D visualization and they had to work around the bladder and the ureter, excuse me, uterus and, and, and um, other abdominal viscera that really made it hard to get around certain corners where this, this particular device has uh, given them 3D visualization and it allows them to work in, in corners and pockets that are really hard to see with traditional minimally invasive uh, techniques. Um, so therefore, you know, it's really advanced the capabilities of surgeons in these fields. In neurosurgery is certainly being explored. You know, to my knowledge, it's not become commonplace. You know, certainly with the microscope, we have 3D visualization. 
Uh, the areas we're working in a lot of time is it's a direct track. We're not really having to look around corners that much. So I'm sure there's going to be some applications as this technology improves. There'll be applications in the field of neurosurgery. But at this point, it's not a day-to-day -day use tool. Uh, something else that's uh, gaining popularity and, and gaining some support in the literature is uh, uh, laser interstitial thermal therapy or LIT therapy. This is yet again another minimally invasive uh, technique. Drill a burr hole. There's a, uh, a guiding device and a probe. Essentially, you know, using certain stereotactic uh, um, modalities and using real-time MRI, the probe is placed into the target itself or tumor, and then a laser is used that's emitted from the tip to heat up using thermal energy to destroy the tumor. And uh, you can monitor this real time. So it's actually done in an MRI suite, be it in the operating room or in a diagnostic MRI suite. And uh, you know, there's, it's recently approved by the FDA. Uh, there's a company supporting this and promoting it, and there's centers that are uh, currently using this. And uh, again, it's not something I think is being commonly used uh, in every center throughout the country, uh, but as more data and information is gained, uh, we'll see uh, what role this will have uh, for the tumors that we have to deal with. Other uh, instruments you may come across or surgery may be talking about would be intraoperative imaging modalities, ultrasound, CAT scan, or MRI that are used in the operating room. Uh, ultrasound, uh, ultrasonography is, uh, again, not a tool that's new, uh, but it remains a very effective tool, particularly dealing with tumors. Uh, you know, intraoperatively, this would be our, our intraoperative navigation platform, our, uh, our uh, reconstruction of the, the brain. And then you see here you have a cystic mass and the MRI. You, you put it, once you do your craniotomy and open your dura, you can put the probe right on the brain. You can see the, the superficial structures of the brain, the cystic tumor, and the deeper structures. Not only can this help, just like a navigation system can help direct you to the lesion, you know, it can make a smaller opening, a more directed approach. Once you've resected the lesion, you can use the probe once again to see if there's any residual tumor that you may not see directly under the microscope. Um, commonly used, you know, certainly not, you know, fancy and new like some of the other tools, but still a very effective tool. Uh, intraoperative applications for CAT scan and MRI. Um, this is becoming more and more uh, popular. Uh, like every other tool, it's not applicable to all cases, but certain tumors, certain surgical procedures, it's, it's um, highly uh, effective and helpful. Uh, ideally, uh, you know, post-operatively after resection of a tumor, particularly with a low-grade glioma or certain, uh, in certain cases, high-grade glioma, you can get a post-operative imaging study in the operating room while the patient's still intubated, while there's still a sterile field. And if there's any residual tumor or if there's a hematoma or something else that concerns you, you can address that right then and there instead of taking the patient out of the operating room and having to bring them back. So I'm going to switch to post-operative or after surgery. Um, you know, what is it you're going to expect to see or what will you run into? I think uh, multidisciplinary multi tumor boards are becoming uh, common, if not the standard of care. Uh, it's very adjunctive additional treatments that you may uh, have to contend with, such as chemotherapy, radiation therapy, or stereotactic radiosurgery, depending on the, the tumor that you're dealing with. Uh, clinical trials are an option in certain cases. And then uh, I think no discussion would be complete here if we weren't talking about support groups for the patient and the family as they navigate through this process, pre-op, post-op, post and uh, beyond. Multidisciplinary tumor boards, you know, this is a component, of, you know, I think a standard component of any comprehensive oncology program or neuro-oncology program. You know, nowadays, nobody works in a vacuum. I mean, any surgeon, you know, neurosurgeon should work with the neurology colleagues, oncology colleagues, those from radiation oncology, pathology, radiology, various experts that bring a lot to the table from their various uh, uh, fields of expertise. Uh, the support staff, there's significant layering in the support staff uh, to make any um, successful neurosurgery or neuro-oncology program uh, thrive. Uh, and oftentimes, Patients' cases are discussed before surgery, and then they're discussed again after surgery once you determine what the uh, tumor is and, and to discuss the various options for moving forward. Um, stereotactic radiosurgery uh, is, another, is another very great tool or adjunct to the treatment of patients with uh, certain brain tumors. Uh, there's several different machines that are used. Many people are familiar with gamma knife. 
Another one out there is a CyberKnife. And there's a number of what we call LINAC, or linear accelerator-based systems, Nogalis, Varian Trilogy, and others. Uh, different machines, slightly different physics on some of them. The, the end result is the same. It's very focused, high-dose radiation to a precise target or a stereotactic, three-dimensionally uh, defined target. It, it is a little bit of a misnomer. There is no surgery. It's just I like to explain to my patients that it's surgical precision to the radiation, hitting the tumor, sparing the surrounding structures. Uh, commonly used in, for certain metastatic tumors, uh, sometimes meningiomas, uh, schwannomas, uh, occasionally employed in uh, infiltrating tumors like gliomas, um, and, and a number of other lesions. Sometimes we do this instead of surgery. Sometimes we do this after surgery in concert with it. Sometimes people have surgery and traditional radiation, and then radiosurgery at a later date to um, try and uh, uh, deal with any potential progression down the road. Um, I, I think if anything, it's just added to our armamentarium. It's not really competing uh, with uh, other treatments that are out there. Um, as stated, clinical trials, I mean, certainly, particularly with, uh, um, with the various hybrid gliomas, I mean, this is crucial. We need this information to advance the field. Um, I think any surgeon, uh, if they're being honest, will admit, you know, the surgery is not going to be the thing that cures gliomas. It's an important role. We, we have a role as surgeons in helping patients with gliomas and other tumors, but uh, tumors, particularly like uh, gliomas, the hybrid gliomas, the, the advancements are going to be in, in, in medicines and, and, uh, and various other um, uh, non-surgical treatments that will help us, uh, you know, control these tumors and, and hopefully cure them at some point. And as we touched on support groups, uh, such, such that are provided by the American Brain Tumor Association. I think this is critical for patients and families. This is a, an overwhelming experience, you know, to us in the medical community, you know, anybody that deals with brain tumor patients. I mean, this is a day-to-day -day, um, experience for us, but for the patients and families we're dealing with, this is hands down, you know, the most monumental thing in their life that they're facing. And, uh, you know, we all try to respect that and understand that. And I think these support groups and organizations like the ABTA you know, really help patients and families navigate through this. And I appreciate the opportunity for being invited to speak and uh, give a brief overview. Um, uh, I will open this up to questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. We really appreciate that. We do have a few questions. Um, so I will kind of triage, triage them for you. Um, we have a question regarding if imaging and surgical techniques have improved um, over the last 10 or so years to avoid, um, to improve the chance of avoiding complications. Are you asking, have they improved to do that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I think there's no doubt. I mean, the, uh, like the, uh, particularly the, CT and MRI, the clarity, the, the, the definition, we can see exactly where the tumor is at. The intraop. Can you hear me? There you go. Yes. Okay. Now, I would say without a doubt, the, the, uh, the tools that are out there, the operating microscope, the endoscope, the navigation systems, like the, the frameless stereotactic navigation systems that allow us to really hone in, you know, the, the most direct way to get to the tumor, to know where the critical structures are around the tumor. Uh, without a doubt, it's safer, you know, approaching and resecting uh, these tumors now than it was, you know, 20, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, it's not to say it's without risk. These are still major surgeries, and there's very real risk every time um, you're undergoing a craniotomy for resection of the tumor. Uh, but it, it is, you know, every major center throughout the country now, most of them, uh, you know, take on patients with brain tumors and successfully, uh, you know, tackle this problem on, on a daily basis. Great, thank you. Another question is in regards to a meningioma. How do you know, how do you decide whether to follow the watchful waiting or go with surgery? Is there some determining factors you as a surgeon would recommend? Right, and that's an excellent question. And we actually just had a conference this morning where we were discussing this with our residents. And, uh, you know, that, as a general rule, you know, if someone comes in with an imaging study, and we see this all the time where there's an incidental finding of a mass that appears like a meningioma. A couple of things. You know, number one, I, uh, what I teach my residents, and it's, I, 
I was taught this as well, you know, if tumor is a rumor, tissue is the issue. It, it, what, what that means is we cannot definitively diagnose a tumor on imaging. With that said, you know, you can see a lesion that's outside the brain, but attached to the dura, homogeneously enhancing what we call extra axial outside the brain, you know, classic, most consistent with a meningioma. But I can't say definitively unless I go and remove it or get a piece of it. However, you know, if it looks benign like a classic meningioma, and it's behaving benignly, meaning there's no symptom, it's not a large mass causing pressure, causing mass effect, there's no cerebral edema. So if it's small and benign looking and behaving benignly, I, most of us take a benign approach and just watch it, you know, repeat a film, and if it's not growing, you leave it alone. Um, if it shows evidence of growing, you can make an argument to treat at that time, which could be surgery or radio surgery, depending on size and location. So the opposite, you know, if you've got someone that's coming in and they got symptoms, headaches, numbness, weakness, and you have imaging studies that shows a mass, such as a meningioma that's sizable, causing mass effect of pressure on the brain, you know, and you know, we think the symptoms are related to that. That's what tips the scales to consider intervening. Great, thank you. Um, how many times can you perform a craniotomy in the same area of the skull and the brain? Uh, really, I mean, as many times as you need. You know, it, it, I would say where we run into this the most would be uh, gliomas, hydrate gliomas where, as, as your, the viewers know, we, unfortunately we cannot cure these tumors. We just try to control them. I mean, there's certainly a push to try and find a cure, but at this point we're trying to just do our best to control these tumors. They, you know, they don't spread. They don't metastasize like other malignancies. They just recur. And you know, when, when can you consider, consider reoperating? Well, if someone's had a good response to initial treatment and the tumor recurs, and it recurs in a mass-like fashion, like presenting as a solid mass instead of just diffusely infiltrating, and it's causing symptoms, you know, you can consider reoperating again. Now, arguably, this is um, somewhat controversial. There are certain schools of thought, certain um, centers or surgeons that really do not favor that, but there are others that do. I, in my fellowship, we had a number of cases where we operated three, four, five times. And, uh, you know, it's case by case. It's patient and family dependent. Um, you know, we, we need to, our, at the end of the day, our job is to respect the patient's wishes, the family's wishes, and, you know, do our best to provide, you know, safe options. And um, if, it, if it seems that the risk is reasonable or low and we think we can safely get in and, and debulk this again, and, we, you know, if it's reasonable, if it's going to provide, you know, improvement in their survival and maintain their quality of life, you know, there's a lot of surgeons out there that think it's uh, not a reasonable consideration to reoperate again. But the, you know, the risk you run into, you're usually dealing with someone that's had, you know, they've got scar tissue, they've had radiation, they've had chemotherapy. Uh, it makes it more challenging to operate. The risks are higher in terms of injury or infection. But uh, it's, you know, I, I think it's not uncommon and not or unheard of for people that have had multiple surgeries. Great. Thanks. And there was kind of an additional question regarding, so you've had surgery, and you discussed the meningio meningioma, sorry, still being there. Um, you know, can a meningioma just stay in the brain if it's causing minimal deficits on a day-to-day -day living? Would, you know, could a person go through the course of life and still have that meningioma there? Uh, in short, yes. I mean, there's some people that live their whole lives with a meningioma uh, that I, I mean, we see frequently people that are uh, imaged in their, from their 20s up to their 90s that have masses in their brain that look consistent with meningioma that are causing symptoms and have obviously been living with it. You know, for reasons we don't all fully understand, some of them, even benign ones, non-malignant benign meningiomas, which the majority are, some of them grow at different rates. Some are very calcified, slow-growing, will barely change in size, and people can live with it their whole life. Others can be like the picture I showed you where it was like literally the size of almost a softball, um, that clearly that thing grew more rapidly, even though that proved to be a benign meningioma, it grew more rapidly than other ones. You know, and it, I think what you said at the beginning of your question, you know, they imply that someone had surgery and there was residual meningioma. Um, that's seen quite frequently as well. And, you know, if, if you operated because it was a large mass causing mass effect and you debulked it or removed a lot of it and relieved the mass effect, you know, it's not unreasonable to watch and wait. Sometimes you devascularize the tumor and it won't grow. Sometimes that leftover tumor may 
grow really slow and you can live with it your whole life. But sometimes it may start to progress again and it may require additional treatment such as repeat surgery or radio surgery, which is commonly used nowadays. Um, it really is, uh, it really, you know, there are generalities, but it truly is case by case. But, you know, the, the common term we use is maximal safe resection. You know, even if it's a benign tumor, anybody that's suffering from this obviously wants the thing out and wants to put it behind them. But any surgeon will tell you, you know, they want to go in and remove it all, but they're not going to have a hesitation of leaving a little bit of benign tumor behind instead of risking injuring a person and causing permanent deficits like paralysis. So, you know, we go in trying to remove it all, but at times, parts of tumor need to be left behind because it's just not safe to remove. And the lesser of two evils is just leaving a small bit behind and watching it waiting and considering other treatments if necessary. Great, thanks. We have a large um, constituent space of meningioma patients and, you know, kind of living their life with this tumor in there is questions that we hear all the time. So that's really helpful. Um, next is the gamma knife treatment recommended um, for the residual tumor when the glioma is close to the brain stem? Well, that's, that's the, uh, the challenge with stereotactic radio surgery, where there's gamma knife or uh, variant trilogy or cyber knife, these different machines that perform this you know, focused conformal high dose radiation just to the tumor. The, the, the advantage of these, of these um, approaches is it's, you're hitting just the tumor and sparing the surrounding structures, but there is a little bit of fall off or spillover, if you will, from the target you're treating. And the entire essence of planning to do this safely is to know what are the structures that are at risk, the, the eyeballs, the nerves to the eyes, the brain stem, as you mentioned. And, you know, the, you know, long story short, to answer your question there, if the lesion is too close to the brain stem, sometimes you cannot do radio surgery if you're going to give too much, if the dose you're given to the tumor will spill over to the brain stem. Uh, but the advantage of this technique is it, you know, the people with the experience, the centers that do a lot of this, you know, oftentimes they, they can really focus radiation just to the tumor, and it can be surprisingly close to critical structures and really spare those structures. Now, again, this comes to be case by case, um, but uh, you know, being close to the brainstem does not mean radio surgery is, is is not an option. It certainly is. It just really depends how close, how big the tumor is, and what's the dose you're trying to get to the tumor using stereotactic radio surgery. Great, thank you. Uh, another question is, does uh, radiation affect the healing of the skull and the integration of bone clips in the skull? Integration of the bone clip? They wrote clips, but I'll, I'll leave that to you. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, standard radiotherapy, not, not radiosurgery, but radiotherapy without a doubt can affect wound healing. That's typically why after craniotomy for tumor, uh, if it proves to be a tumor that requires radiation, a malignant tumor or an aggressive appearing tumor, uh, we typically wait several weeks because we want the wound to heal, the soft tissue parts, the skin, the subcutaneous tissue. The skull itself in the adult oftentimes uh, doesn't fully fuse or heal back to the skull. As you mentioned, the clips, that's why we use these little titanium plates and screws, that's what's most commonly employed, to help fix the, the, the piece of bone, or what we call the bone flap, the window in the skull. So we, you know, when we do craniotomy, which basically means we typically use power tools nowadays to remove a, a window or a piece of bone, to make a window in the skull, go in, remove the tumor, put the covering of the, of the brain back on, the dura, affix that piece of bone or um, bone flap back to the skull, and that's where we use these little mini plates and screws that are like a millimeter thick, and the screws are three or four millimeters in length, and that holds the skull flap in place. Um, you know, I have reoperated on people years later where parts of the bone have fused back, but a lot of it hasn't. It's just scarred in and held in place with the, the little titanium implants. Um, will radiation affect that? I'm sure there's no doubt it can infect, uh, affect bone, bone healing, uh, but that's where those plates and screws and, and the natural scar tissue come into place. And it's typically not an issue. It's not going to affect, you know, in terms of stability of it or, or the skull providing a, a protection. So, you know, it, as a general rule, the radiation can affect healing, but in terms of the skull bone interface, the, the bone flap skull interface, it's, it's really not a, a concern we deal with. Great. Um, and one more question. We hear a lot, I would say, you know, every day. People are questioning us, um, what's the difference between gamma and stereotactic radiosurgery and the brand names and 
the uh, machines and, you know, is an older machine going to be as good as a newer machine? Um, how do you explain to, to your patients the difference between, you know, the actual technique versus the brand name and guide them into making, you know, an educated decision? Right. Well, that's kind of a loaded question, and I'm sure I'll offend some centers or surgeons or physicians out there, but in my opinion, based off of my experience seeing Gamma Knife and CyberKnife systems and Linac-based systems and the literature that's out there, for the overwhelming majority of conditions we deal with, the metastasis, the ABMs, uh, you know, the, um, the um, you know, trigeminal neuralgia, et cetera, that's treated, I, I don't think it makes a difference. I think that the bigger concern is the team you're dealing with. Uh, are they comfortable in dealing with these conditions? Are they comfortable dealing with the surgical and the non-surgical? Uh, you know, is your multidisciplinary team, your radiation oncologist and surgeon, you know, comfortable with stereotactic radio surgery when it's indicated what to look for if, it, if there's complications and the machine that they're on? You know, it's just like, um, you know, what type of, you know, intraoperative, you know, MRI should we use this one or that one? Or what type of uh, um, uh, instrumentation should we use? It's not quite the same corollary, but, you know, at the end, there, there are some different physics. There are some different components of the machine. But I'd say, and then there, and there may be a few cases where one technique, technology is a little better than another for, for certain types of lesions or tumors, but the overwhelming majority, I think the focus should be on are you comfortable with the surgeon and radiation oncologist you're working with and you have a good rapport with them, not uh, what brand name machine that they have. But, you know, they, you know there's, there's as much advertising and then, you know, competition for market share uh, that really, uh, I think, colors some of these discussions. Thank you. Another question popped up. Um, is there a limit to the amount of radiation that a patient can receive? Yes. You know, with traditional uh, radiotherapy, there are maximum doses, and this gets beyond my area of expertise, but certainly you worry about radiation uh, uh, toxicity. Uh, uh, with radiosurgery, we certainly have repeated uh, radiosurgical treatments to the same lesion if it fails, if there's tumor progression, um, and that's been done before, but the traditional fractionated radiotherapy schemes, I mean, there are dose limitations. Some of it's not fully understood, but there are, you know, norms that are out there or accepted standards. And uh, the short answer is yes, there are some limitations. Okay. Um, the questions keep coming. Um, if you have a malignant tumor that recurred, but there are no symptoms, do you recommend that um, they should just wait until some type of symptom pops up, or should you know surgery take place immediately? Um, I mean, generally. You know, if you're dealing with a malignant tumor, like a primary brain tumor such as a glioblastoma or, or a metastasis, a metastatic tumor to the brain, you know, it's pretty common nowadays, even after you've initially been diagnosed and treated by whatever modality, the surgery, radiation, chemo, or combination thereof, you know, most times we're, we're patients are undergoing surveillance imaging every three months or every four months to look for tumor recurrence or progression uh, so that we can consider, you know, treatment options if available. Ideally, you want to do it before their symptoms. The question is, you know, are there treatment options available? And is it surgery? It's not always surgery. A lot of times it's going to be second-line chemo, maybe additional radiation if it's available, or brachytherapy or radiosurgery. Or if the example would be this uh, laser interstitial thermal therapy if that becomes an option. You know, it, it, it truly is a case-by-case. Case. I mean, you know, there are times where you can give me an example where someone has recurrence or, or progression of a tumor that's seen radiographically, um, an example of, say, a GBM, and they may not have symptoms, and the question is, are there further treatment options? Is there another chemotherapy that can be offered? Is, if, if surgery is an option, is it safe to get there? Is it surgically accessible and amenable to resection? I mean, there's so many what-ifs depending on, um, you know, the, the, the patient, the tumor, the location, or imaging characteristics. But if there are options available, you know, generally we want to start thinking of intervening prior to symptoms occurring. Okay. Uh, next is, are there any techniques that are available to safely remove scar tissue? Uh, there may be that I'm not aware of, but the problem is you go in and remove scar tissue, just scar tissue is going to replace it. And I guess a, a better way of thinking of it, like, is there ways we can, you know, prevent scar tissue from occurring, but that's just any time we 
perform surgery, which is essentially traumatizing tissue, the response by the body is to, to heal that, and that's where scar tissue comes in. So, you know, going in to directly deal with just scar tissue is not, particularly in the brain itself or in the supporting structures, is not something that's, to my knowledge, is commonly done. Perfect. Um, someone is asking about further radiation. Should a patient stay away from dental x-rays, bone density, anything like that, if they um, have had a brain tumor? Due to fear of like too much accumulation of radiation, or um, due to fear of like somehow affecting the tumor. I'm not sure that how the question was worded, but either one. I mean, you know, I don't know if I know enough to really answer that in an educated fashion. I would say, is obviously, if you're dealing with a brain tumor, particularly a malignant brain tumor, that's your, uh, you know, obviously that's the most important focus in your life. If you're getting dental x-rays or, or other diagnostic procedures, I think that's really a, you know, not a major concern. I wouldn't really sweat that or worry about those doses or toxicity. I don't think that's really going to affect the other treatments you're having. But that's something you can bring up with a radiation oncologist. But to, to my knowledge and experience, I, I don't think that's a, a common uh, thing to worry about, and I wouldn't stress about that. And uh, certainly, we have brain tumor patients that need to undergo other therapies, treatments, diagnostic workups, and I don't think twice if, if that's indicated about getting a CAT scan or imaging studies or, or, or further workup. OK. And a question. Um, you know, I noticed in your um, your bio that your focus is the patient and patient decision and family making family decision making, which is refreshing. What would you recommend to the patients and the families that we have online? How to best prepare them for you know their visit with their surgeon? What what makes a really good visit for you? How should they prepare? I, I think that. As surprising as it may sound, it's amazing how many times I have patients that come to the office and they come by themselves. You know, and you know, it's just it's over. You know, occasionally it's because they're not sure what's going on, and I'm the one that's breaking it to them. But even times where they know they have they're being sent to a neurosurgeon for consideration of surgery because of a mass that was found, and they come by themselves. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but it's overwhelming. You know, in the span of 15 minutes to an hour, you're trying to have a conversation with an individual and tell them, yes, you have a mass in your brain. You know, we're going to be proposing, you know, craniotomy or brain surgery to remove it, and here's all the potential benefits and risks. And, you know, oftentimes, as you can imagine, you get that blank stare, and everything I'm saying is going, you know, it's just going one ear out the other, because understandably they're just blown away by, you know, facing the prospects of surgery, particularly brain surgery. So having family or friends present uh, to help, you know, ask questions, write down answers, you know, help support the patient, and, you know, I think when families and friends are engaged and asking questions, it, you know, it, 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 uh, it just provides for better care and a better experience for the patient. They're more comfortable. They're not by themselves. They don't feel as threatened by the experience. Uh, a lot of things that they wouldn't think to ask are being asked by the family. And, uh, you know, I, I, and as a surgeon, I don't feel threatened if people are asking questions. I think people get better care because it brings up stuff that I may have not even thought about bringing up uh, that may be important to them. So. You know, it, it, and I think that's, it sounds like the simplest thing, but it's surprising how often uh, you don't really have family or friends or support there for, those in, for that initial discussion. Great. That looks like all the questions that we have for right now. Um, sorry, one just popped up. <laughs> I'm just trying to read it. Um, the question is, they're under the impression that an anaplastic oligoastrocytoma grade 3 is a glioblastoma without necrosis. Is this true? Well, oligoastro implies that there's two uh, tumor histologies there. We typically, in terms of dealing with prognosis and how we treat it, we, we go off of the astrocytoma component. So we're basically dealing with a, a WHO grade 3, or anaplastic astrocytoma, and it, it's, it's a spectrum, it's a lineage, so that, you know, the next step up, the, as, as there's more changes and more uh, degeneration of the tumor, it becomes a glioblastoma. Histologically, to the pathologist, they look for several criteria to say, yeah, this is grade 4 versus grade 3 versus grade 2. So to the 
under the microscope to the pathologist, which is which are the individuals that ultimately determine what it is we're dealing with, you know, they're, they're marking us a grade three. So it's in the same family as glioblastoma. It's, you know, these are all called astrocytomas. Grade three is the anaplastic. Grade four is what we call the glioblastoma. They're all the same type of cell or tumor. Uh, just the glioblastoma is more aggressive. It has more um, uh, malignant features to it, if you will. So, you know, it, I guess, you know, necrosis or microvascular proliferation or what makes an anaplastic astrocytoma, you know, flips the switch to convert it to a, a, a glioblastoma. But in and of itself right now, it doesn't have those features, if that's what they're calling it. So it's not behaving like a glioblastoma. It behaves like an anaplastic astrocytoma. So prognosis is better. It's not quite as aggressive. But uh, at the end of the day, it's, unfortunately, that's still a malignant brain tumor. Uh, it's something we cannot cure. We just are pushing and getting better and better at controlling it at this point. Thank you for letting us sneak in one last question. And sure. thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, thank you, Dr. Barrett of Providence Hospital and Medical Centers. Let's pause just for a moment to conclude our webinar recording.